Welcome. Today we are going to move our attention and address pragmatism, which is more than any other philosophy that we're going to address in this class, a quintessential American philosophy. We're moving away from Europe uh, and many of the thoughts that are engaged between England and Germany and France and others, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here uh, in America with pragmatism. We're addressing two people specifically uh, with a little bit of extra attention paid to a third. Um, the main leaders of American pragmatism that we are going to address is William James, who will be found here, and John Dewey, who we will get to in the second part. So what is pragmatism? It's really a school of thought. It's not a single philosophy, as it were. It concerns things not as they ought to be, or even as they are, but really how things appear to be. Like existentialism, it begins with the notion of the subjective, looking from your perspective, moving out. Practically speaking, truth is based on the usefulness of ideas. Whatever works is essentially true. Truth is a process for pragmatism, constantly changing according to time, place, or personal experience. There is no, broadly speaking, objective notion of truth. Pragmatism tries to look at things as they are, how they appear to be, and make decisions off of what can be known. You're going to look, you're going to glance, and you're going to make decisions from that. Like empiricism and rationalism, this is contrary to notions of idealism, which believes that even though we may not know the truth, we may not know the thing in itself, that it truly exists and that we should endeavor to understand it the best way we can. Practically speaking, the truth is found in ideas, which is where we arrive at the developments of those principles which guide us. We see this in Kant and his categorical imperative and Hegel's dialectic, for instance. But this is not notions of pragmatism, neither of which deny, by the way, that there's no basis for constructing judgments about the world around us. Yet, uh, there are those who will oftentimes confuse these ideas. Pragmatism is a distinctively American philosophy. Uh, it is something that comes out of America and emerges out of the scope of what we see here in the American experience, away from the philosophies of England and continental Europe. Broadly speaking, there are three doctrines associated with American pragmatism. Beliefs are hypotheses and ideas are plans of action. This is a theory of our mind and how our minds work. Ideas can be clarified by showing their relation to action. This is the account of meaning that we would have and is the second doctrine of pragmatism. The third is that beliefs are true when they are successful guides for prediction and action. This is the theory of truth. This is really where we're gonna spend most of our time today. Right? That beliefs are true when they help actions and predictions of what's going to happen. So this is broadly speaking, what pragmatism is. We'll kind of address some of the nuances of it and then kind of revisit this idea and, and see if we agree that this is what pragmatism is when we're drawing out the works of Dewey and James and, and a little bit of Pierce. The real founder of pragmatism is Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839 to 1914. While Dewey and James may have bigger names for a broader public, Pierce really started this whole American venture of pragmatism, formulating his ideas on pragmatism around 1868 and then furthered them in the late 1870s, around 77 and 78, in different works that he would publish at this time. Pragmatism grew out of his attempt to understand logic in relation to science. Most importantly was the science of the mind. There were other pragmatists to whom he would gather together and discuss things, including Chauncey Wright, Oliver Wendell Holmes, famed American jurist, uh, Supreme Court justice, and Nicholas St. John Green, who's got at least one too many names. All right, so we, we, these are other American pragmatists who'd gather along uh, with him. 
Uh, William James was one of those that Pierce would also gather, and they founded what was known as the Metaphysical Club in Cambridge, Massachusetts, most of which of these men were connected to Harvard in one way or another. They either were graduates of Harvard or would teach there. Um, by the way, this, this book that I just showed the image of from Lewis Manand, The Metaphysical Club, is a great book if you're wanting to understand the thought of the people at this time, the whole Gilded Age philosophy in America, and really the thought that Cambridge and Boston, to a wider extent, was kind of the hub of the intellectual universe, according to Americans in this Gilded Age. James really learns his idea of pragmatism from Pierce at this time and his connection to the Metaphysical Club. And Dewey will later be a student of Pierce at Johns Hopkins University in the 1880s. So this is both of these men have their roots of pragmatism and pragmatic thought coming from Pierce. Most scholars will look at the term pragmatism and see this as a term that was created by Pierce in 1878. Although we do have an example of none other than Kant using it in an earlier work of his, The Anthropology, from a pragmatic point of view. Really, Kant used it, but Kant is not a pragmatist. Pierce used it and is, and therefore gets credit for it, even though Kant used the word earlier. Uh, it derives from the Greek word pragma, meaning things done. And this is a method of ascertaining the meaning of hard words or abstract concepts. We're trying to understand how things are actually done. What produces this? It's based upon experienced things. So it's not just abstract ideas that are completely abstract, but we're bringing them back to our experiences and then addressing them once more. Here we see a connection of American pragmatism with notions of idealism and empiricism and rationalism and trying to figure out where is the nature of understanding and the truth, right? We have a, a fourth kind of contested school of thought here with pragmatism. And we can kind of look at both era and location being important for these schools of thoughts. For pragmatism, knowledge and truth are always in terms of personal needs, verifications, or consequences. It's always back to you, back to the subjective, back to how you are going to move and address something. Pragmatism is known by most of us as a theory on how to approach the truth. This is really the legacy of James and Dewey and their emphasis on this idea. Though the initial purpose when Pierce was thinking it up was as a theory of mind. It's really there to help us understand how our mind works and how we don't go crazy in an ever-changing world. Pierce believed that concepts are plans of action or rules for interpreting experience. They tell us what to expect and are useful to the degree that they eliminate surprises. Pierce was concerned with how is it that we understand new novel ideas? How is it that we deal with things that aren't what we're expecting? Well, our mind either changes or we change the experience based on that, right? It's a theory on relative subjectivity of the mind, keeping basic notions of what we would say today is mental health, right? The beliefs also explain our experiences. We know what to expect. When we go into a room, when we go into a certain setting, our beliefs about what to expect there shape those experiences themselves. It's not just abstract ideas, uh, but it's your memory, your intuition, that's what going to be telling you how to expect this. Therefore, he rejects all the previous ideas of intuition, those ideas held by the rationalists, Spinoza, Descartes, and Leibniz. Specifically, he's pointing more attention against Spinoza than he is Descartes and Leibniz, but we can make this connection as well. And in some ways, uh, we'll say that pragmatism is 19th century American version of empiricism, uh, not following Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, uh, and not the idealism of Kant and Hegel 
or the rejection of this post-Hegelian idealism that we're going to find within existentialism, but as its own American sort of school of thought also based in opposition to the assertions of certain rationalists. Recognition for pragmatists, for James, only takes, and Pierce and Dewey, only takes place after prior experience, but rests on connections between experiences and expectations. These, along with the use of language, gives us habits of interpretation that permits us to interpret all of our new experiences. As such, we can recognize things, not just physical stimulation, and we'll end up forming an understanding of the truth. You see and understand things because you're expecting them, and you have words to categorize them. You have language to express what it is that you see or think or feel. Prior to language, you don't really fully understand what's happening to you. It's a series of jumbled events. When you can identify what it is through speech, you can build more expectations on the experience and what you're expecting the future to hold as you move from one arena to another. Truth, then, is, is not an absolute, but rather it's just a reflection of our deep-seated habits. Your habits are the truth, at least practically speaking. For Pierce, a priori truths are just those no notions which are agreeable to reason, that which we find ourselves inclined to believe. They are not, quote, truths in any absolute ways. Rather, our mind understands truths through a series of logic proofs. If X, then Y, this is Y, therefore, this must be X. Our experiences shape and tell us all of these things, and that's how truth works. It's all a theory for understanding the mind and how we approach the broader world. Pierce is not talking about objective reality because for Pierce, what can objectively be known is just what we habitually or logically can agree to. But it's not objective. Everything starts from this position of the subjective. Unless your scholarly interests are in education formation, at which point you might be more familiar with Dewey, or in law, at which point you probably are familiar with the name Oliver Wendell Holmes, the greatest pragmatist to come out of the metaphysical club and advance these ideas is William James. His family was a very important, notable family in American history during the Gilded Age. Uh, his brother is an author. The James family was just connected in all sorts of different things. Uh, and so we know a little bit more about him and our attentions are probably more like, yeah, this is the guy that I know. 1842 to 1910, out of New York, American uh, notions of pragmatism. Really, he's cosmopolitan. He's not just an American. He was educated not only in different schools in the United States, but also went to England, France, Germany, and Switzerland. He will get his medical degree uh, from Harvard Medical School in 1868, and this is where he's going to gain familiarity with Pierce and his notions of pragmatism. His writings are important in many different ways, depending on what it is that we're trying to draw from and address. Pragmatism obviously isn't going to be very important in understanding the nature of pragmatism. The Will to Believe in Other Essays is a fantastic dialogue that he got into with William Clifford uh, and debating on the nature of belief. Is it okay? Is it rational to believe? Is it okay to believe in the irrational beliefs? Uh, and how does all that work? And depending on what avenue you're going to address, some people will look at this work of James is really important. If you're at all involved in trying to understand religious experience, or the scholarly approach to religion, his work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, is also uh, very important in this sort of construction, especially for what becomes known as the Harvard School of Thought in Religious Studies. 
one of the two major American schools of thought for religious studies, the other coming out of the University of Chicago, and then still others will be grounded for the American experience outside of England and have a much more anthropological approach. William James, much like his younger brother, Henry James, who's a famed American novelist, uh, really kind of dabbled with his career. Uh, his family was well-connected enough that he could kind of do anything, and he dabbled in painting, chemistry, psychology, and eventually kind of medicine before we really see his work and emphasis, not in the arts or even his medical understanding, but in philosophy. He will accompany Louis Agassiz, a famed naturalist at the time, on a trip up the Amazon, where he will also then spend two years in Europe, kind of with this naturalistic emphasis. Most of this is in Germany. Spending all this time really in the Black Forest was dark and was depressing for James. Uh, and at this point, he'll actually even contemplate suicide. Uh, then, in 1872, he'll receive an appointment to the post of psychology uh, at Harvard, and he called this a perfect godsend to him. And being able to address the human mind and addressing notions of psychology uh, will really help him to be happy again and thrive. He also liked to spend a lot of time outdoors uh, and enjoyed mountain climbing. Uh, though in June of 1899, he went climbing alone uh, in the Adriandacs and he got lost. Uh, and this time, probably with also some issues of stress and dehydration, he ends up straining his heart and ends up getting an irreparable lesion upon it. And he will die of heart trouble 10 years later in 1910 in New Hampshire as a result of that. James's treatment of pragmatism begins with a story, a word picture, something we can all imagine and perceive and, and think about. It begins with a squirrel. A man wants to see the squirrel. What does he do? He races after the squirrel and the squirrel naturally goes and climbs a tree. And the man wants to look at the squirrel and the squirrel keeps running around the tree to always be on the opposite side of the tree than the man. He's circling the tree, for sure. The question we have while the squirrel runs around the tree is does the man run around the squirrel or not? Is there an objective answer to this? The squirrel is always on the opposite side of the tree than the man, and the man is clearly running around the tree. But does the man run around the squirrel? Probably you're yelling in your mind right now, yes, absolutely, or no, he's not. Why is there such a division and distinction about this? Because how we're approaching this question is different. This banal question that doesn't seem to have any greater significance helps us understand how we conceive of notions of the truth. For some, the man runs around the squirrel because he goes from the north to the south to the east and the west of the squirrel, all four cardinal directions. He is going around the squirrel. For others, to go around the squirrel means that you are on the right and the left and the front and the back of the squirrel, at which point the man never successfully did that. So he didn't go around the squirrel. What basis does the understanding of the term run around the squirrel have? And is there one that is more true or less true than the other? And which one would you side with and why? If the point of understanding the world around us is to have language that we can communicate and express ideas and there is some sort of reality, why is it that a little question like, does a man run around the squirrel or not, has such division? It's not even whether or not squirrels are good. They're not. They just have a better PR agent than rats, right? They're rats with fluffy tails. They're very destructive to your personal property. A couple of them out in the field might be cute. And then they destroy all your stuff. Then you don't want them anymore. Right? But 
what do we do? How do we approach these things? This is the point of pragmatism. Answering these questions, questions that don't have an obvious answer or one answer is not necessarily any more valid than the other answer. This is what James wants us to engage with. Pragmatism is really a method and it's primarily a method of trying to settle metaphysical disputes that otherwise might be indeterminable, that we might not have an answer to. It's a method which tries to interpret each notion by tracing its respective and practical consequences. That whenever we have a dispute and it's serious enough that we ought to be able to show some practical difference that must follow from one side or another. As Hillary Rodham Clinton said after Benghazi, what difference at this point does it make? What difference are we going to find when we're addressing notions of pragmatism? If there can be no difference, then the dispute isn't really worth having. It doesn't explain why you see the world one way or the other. It doesn't make any truth claims if there is no difference. James argues that there's really nothing new in this pragmatic method. Pragmatism represents a perfectly familiar attitude in philosophy, he says, the empiricist attitude, but it represents it as it seems to me, both in a more radical and less objectionable form than has ever been assumed. Right? This is the American view of empiricism. It's from the subjective. Pragmatism does not stand for any sets of results. It is a method. It's much like dialectic was used in the Middle Ages. Right? What are we going to see? We're going to tease out things and try to figure out what difference does something make. James argues that pragmatism unstiffens all of our other theories. That things become a little more lax and easy to understand one way or another. James liked the practical nature of the physical sciences, and he would often borrow from experiments that were done in these realms, including one that he ends up telling us about, uh, Otzfeld, the Leipzig chemist. Otzfeld uh, says that all realities influence our practice, and that influence is in their meaning for us. That he is accustomed to put questions in his classes this way. In what respects would the outcome be different if this alternative or that were true? What difference would it make if you added one chemical and two instead of another? Is it going to ruin the experiment? Is it going to make an explosion, turn everything into salt water, make everything inert, make everything radioactive? It makes a big difference if you're adding a little bit of this as opposed to that. Though he says, if I can find nothing that would become different, then the alternative has no sense. If there's no difference in me adding one thing versus another, then why bother? And all we learn is that they're essentially one and the same. James says it's astonishing to see how many of our philosophical disputes collapse into insignificance the moment you subject them to this simple test of tracing concrete consequence. Philosophers argue with each other all the time from the times of, you know, Plato and Aristotle. But some of the questions, what difference does it make? Well, if we're talking about where our ideas come from between the two, there's a huge difference. And there's a concrete difference. And therefore, it makes a difference on which side of this equation you want to go to. If you want to talk about the value of logic, the difference will be a little bit less important. Aristotle is usually seen as stronger in this camp, but it's not as if Plato says there's no value in it. Same thing if we're going to address other philosophers and address how they understand the world. If we're comparing Descartes and Hume, well, are we talking about the fact that the mind is a powerful organ? Okay, we might agree with that between the two. How about where ideas come from? And do we have any experiences of ideas before the ideas, right? Do we have any conceptions of things before the experience is there? Well, that's gonna make a huge difference. 
let alone when we get to things like cause and effect. How about addressing Bonaventure and Aquinas, 13th century philosophical rivals? Well, if we're trying to argue about the existence of God, you might like one's proofs better than the other, but they're going to get you to the same place. What difference would it make? Not much. It all depends on what the frame of the argument is. And we might side with one a little bit more when we like the notion of sensibility or the realm of ideas or the fact that, you know, cause and effect exists. But if we can't identify a real difference, then again, what difference does it make? James says that there can be no difference anywhere that doesn't make a difference elsewhere, though. No difference in abstract truth that doesn't express itself in a difference in concrete fact and in conduct consequent upon that fact imposed on somebody somehow, somewhere, and some when. Anytime there's a difference, we should be able to tease out what significance that difference made. The aim of philosophy, according to James, the whole function of philosophy ought to find out what the definite difference it will make to you and to me at different instances of our life. If this wood formula or that wood formula is the true one. But this is what we're trying to understand is what's the significance for you if one is true or not? Do we need somebody to spell out all the answers for us like Abelard failed to do and Lombard and others succeeded in? Do we need concrete ideas of where things are? What difference does it make to you if people like Berkeley are correct that all there are are their experience and there is no matter, no concrete reality outside of those things which exist in the mind of you and others and therefore also even God. What difference does that make to you? If it doesn't make any difference, you probably don't understand it enough. But then move on. This is the actual aim of philosophy. According to James, the philosopher's realm is the world of concrete personal experiences. And we want to address your experiences. Did the man run around the squirrel or just the tree? But real experiences change. They are not fixed like so many other ideas. Your real world experience of things varies as you experience things differently. We get a copying of ideas. The popular notion is that a true idea must copy reality, he says. Like other popular views, this one follows an analogy of the most useful experience. Our true ideas of sensible things do indeed copy them. We see some notions of Hume uh, and Locke within this, right? Reflections are copied in the mind. James asks you to shut your eyes and think of yonder clock on the wall, and you will get just such a true picture or copy of its dial. You're familiar with the, the clock that you have around where you're listening to this. You're familiar with what it looks like. It exists in your mind. Notice here also a very strong connection with Berkeley that things exist because of your experience and all things are just experiences in the mind, right? But your ideas of how that clock works, unless you're a clockmaker, he says, is much less of a copy, yet it passes muster, right? You understand, okay, that's fine. And it in no way clashes with reality. Even though it should shrink to the mere word works, James says, that word still serves you truly. And when you speak of the timekeeping function of the clock or of its springs and elasticity, it's hard to see exactly what your ideas can copy. Your ideas aren't exact copies of reality, they're functional copies of reality. You don't know how that clock truly works, 99.9% .9 of you. You might have taken apart clocks, you might have even assembled clocks, but 
you're not really understanding the way the gears and the springs and all this other stuff works, let alone with other types of clocks that have other sorts of circuitry working for them. You have a copy of the basic appearance of it, not the reality that's existent in it. Thus, what we see with pragmatism is that it's not a single thing. It's a method. It's a hotel, according to James, right? This was brought to you by the Italian Papanini. He says that there's innumerable chambers which open out of it. In one room, you may find a man writing an atheistic volume. In the next, someone is on their knees praying for faith and strength. In the third, a chemist investigations uh, of a body's properties. In the fourth, a system of idealist metaphysics might be explained. In the fifth, the impossibility of metaphysics is being argued, as we'll see here with Victor. Right? All of this exists in the same corridor, and all must pass through it if they want a practicable way of getting into or out of their respective rooms. Pragmatism, does it work? What difference does it make? Is the whole heart and soul of the arguments and discussion. Pragmatism is the hotel. It's the hallway. It's not the rooms. It's not the conclusions, according to James. So what does this mean in relation to the truth then? James says to agree in the widest sense with a reality can only mean to be guided either straight up to it or into its surroundings or to be put in a, such a working to touch with it as to handle either it or something connected with it better than if we disagreed. Either intellectually or practically. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to see intellectually does it make a difference or practically does it make a difference? And often agreement will only mean the negative fact that nothing contradictory from the quarter of that reality comes to interfere with the way in which our ideas guide us elsewhere. Our theories are wedged and controlled as nothing else is, right? If your theories of the way the world works holds and controls you uh, and addresses how you're going to look at one conclusion or the other. Yet sometimes alternative theoretic formulas are equally compatible with all the truth that we know, and then we choose between them for subjective reasons. Subjectively, we like one side or the other. We choose the kind of theory to which we are already partial. We follow an elegance or economy to it. I already kind of like this idea, therefore I'm going to go with it. Is it objectively true? Who knows? Objective, it has nothing to do with it. I chose this because it works with what I already understand. It sounds good to me and my ears and my conclusions that I already have adopted. It's gonna help me get where I wanna go. This is why I choose one thing or another. By the way, this also connects James with another one of his works, The Will to Believe. In the will to believe, which some also will kind of subtitle in some ways, the right to believe, right? James addresses what rights we have to believe in certain things or not. James endorses this conclusion, uh, by the way, that we can make leaps of truth only when a clear cut objective evidence is unavailable. He's not telling you to drink poison because you believe it's okay to drink poison, by the way. He doesn't advocate for ignoring or denying evidence that exists out there. This is this work, by the way, a quick aside, is a larger discussion that he's having with a man by the name of William Clifford, who argued that it's wrong always and everywhere for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. For Clifford, you must always have evidence to believe anything, regardless of what it is. James argues that moral questions in fact, even beyond moral questions, uh, will immediately present themselves as questions whose solution cannot wait for a sensible tr uh, proof, and therefore you have to make a decision. We must know the truth when we must avoid or shun error, 
but these are two different laws, thus it's impossible to go with Clifford. Right? We can't always avoid the untruth and always know the truth. There are certain times that we just have to proceed on probable. Right? There might not be sufficient evidence for us to hold something, but we're going to say this is probably the case. There's a certain elegance or economy for me to accepting this as being the case as opposed to not. There might be a horror that we get duped. We might be wrong. James says there's always worse things, and our errors are not awfully solemn things. Right? He definitely is disagreeing with certain trains of thought that exists within Stoicism. Instead, our notion of truth must be like a law court based on the best evidence attainable at the moment. We're always going to be wrong from time to time because there is no objectiveness that truly exists. Essentially, for James, we always operate on insufficient evidence to believe anything, and therefore Clifford's argument that it's wrong always and everywhere for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence is wrong because it can't happen. Then you're not going to believe anything. Then you're not going to do anything. And therefore, you're now making a negative belief instead of a positive one. What is truth then? Truth for us, according to James, is simply a collective name for a verification process. Just as health and wealth and strength are names for other processes connected with life and also pursued because it pays to pursue them. Truth is made just as health, wealth, and strength are made in the course of experience. The true is only the expedient in the way of our thinking just as the right is only expedient in our way of behaving. Things may be true for now and false later. We have to live today by what truth we can get today and be ready tomorrow to call it falsehood. And so again, we can't go with Clifford that it's wrong always to believe on something with insufficient evidence. You have to do, you have to act, you have to live. So you pick what looks the most truth, that's got the most truish arguments, and you go that way. And then if you find evidence to the contrary, you abandon it and move on to a new idea. James says, Ptolemy astronomy, Euclidean space, Aristotelian logic, scholastic metaphysics were expedient for centuries, but human experiences boiled over those limits. And we now call these things only relatively true or true within those borders to experience. Absolutely though, we see them as false, not true. They were true, now they're not true. They helped, they were expedient. Now it's understanding one idea as it moves on, but objectively truth, no. For we know that those limits were casual, causal, and might have been transcended by past theorists, just as they are by present thinkers. Just as many of your present ideas are going to be things that you look back in 10, 20, 30 years from now in your life and you go, oh my goodness sakes, I was so naive or I was so dogmatic in one belief that I didn't listen to other things. That I rejected somebody's claim because they were religious or not religious that I didn't pay attention and listen to these arguments, that I didn't want to objectively look at history beyond my history. And boy, I feel like a fool. I know you personally, that's not gonna be the case. It's gonna be the case, right? This is what happens for all of us. Truth independent, truth that we find merely, truth no longer malleable to human need, truth incorrigible in a word, such truth exists indeed superabundantly or is supposed to exist by rationalist ally-minded thinkers. But then it means only the dead heart of a living tree. And its being there means only the truth that has its paleontology and its prescription and may grow stiff with years of veteran service and petrified in men's regard by sheer antiquity. What is the heart that we have with an independent objective truth? 
it's something held up that you're never going to actually do anything with. Instead, James says, you need to hold what can be true today and be ready to say it's wrong tomorrow. You need to say that many of your ideas today, even though you might have good reason for believing in them, it might just be fashionable ideas for the circle of friends you're in or the mode that our society is in. It might conflict with centuries old knowledge and tradition because we know better and then we learn maybe we don't. Avoid butter, have margarine. Eggs are bad, eggs are good. Eggs are bad, eggs are good. Don't have breast milk, use formula. It's scientifically engineered. Oops. Right? There's been arguments that the 20th century was the century that we gave up what worked and for what sounded good. There's definitely some argument to that. And it's good and important, James would say, to play around with these things, to say, do we have it right? Nah, screwed that one up. They had it right before. But we have to be willing to say they might have had it right before. Oh, you know, there was a downside of that. And we got rid of it and went, mm, yeah, power vacuum really caused a lot of problems. I guess we're going to go back to that. Oops, made a mistake. These are important things for us to say. Hold what seems true, but listen, study, inquire, learn. Otherwise, truth, if you're just going to say, no, this has to be objective, dies and petrifies, and you have no engagement with it. So ultimately, what is pragmatism for James? First, it's just a method. It's just something to help you understand other truths, other ways of approaching things. Do we want to borrow a little bit of Pierce and say it helps you not go crazy? Maybe, right? It's, it's a method that's going to that operate in this way. But second, it's a generic theory of what is just meant by truth. Pragmatism is what's true-ish, true for today. Maybe it's not objectively true, but I'm going to have to throw myself out on a limb and say I'm going to hold this idea to be true for now even though tomorrow maybe it's not. 